You're clean, aren't you? Except for your tower. You're a tower junkie, Roland. Hello and welcome to Tower Junkies, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. If this is your first time listening, Tower Junkies is a podcast celebrating the work of Stephen King with an occasional focus on his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series. We discuss the themes, characters, and, mytho- and mythology of the series in Palaver episodes and review the books and comic series in Kef episodes. We also discuss non-Tower King novels, TV and film adaptations of King's work, and the latest news about all things that serve the King. You can find more of our work at TowerJunkiesPod.com and follow us on every level of social media at Tower Junkies Pod. I'm, your, I'm one of your hosts, Matt Hurt, and today I'm actually flying solo to review Duma Key. Um, yeah, it's Stephen King's 2008 novel, Duma Key. Um, and I'm doing this alone because Tiny is... <laughs> he he read the novel like six or seven years ago and just hasn't read it since. So... Um, and he didn't really seem too eager to reread it. So I'm just going to do this one solo, which happens from time to time. Uh, I do have a special segment, which I'll get to in a second, that involves Tiny. But first, I want to mention that on the website, we updated the website a little bit. First of all, if you visit TowerDrunkiesPod.com at, at all, ever, um, you will notice that I changed the theme around. Like, it's a it's a functional website for the most part. Like I'm not a web designer by any stretch, but I did change the kind of WordPress theme that I had on it. So it's a little bit, I I don't know. I think it looks a little nicer now, but I did add a page. So I used to have Stephen King's bibliography as a separate page, but now I changed that to what I'm calling the master list. So if you go to towerjunkiespod.com slash master list, you'll see a breakdown of every Stephen King novel and adaptation um, in basically chronological order. Um, it's really cool. I use bullet points and everything guys. It's, it's legit. Um, I also threw in Joe Hill's stuff. So as we go through the podcast, I will be adding links to each one of those to correlate with the episode that it covers. Um, but yeah, I'm excited cause it's just a visual representation of all the crap that we can potentially cover on tower junkies. Um, so that's exciting. And it's daunting and it's huge, but it's, it's really, it's, it's exciting nonetheless. Um, I don't have like Castle Rock and, and other stuff that's not like tied to a published work necessarily, uh, to a specific published work, um, yet, but I'll probably expand it a little bit there. But anyway, check that out. Towerjunkiespod.com slash master list. And yeah, let us know what you're most excited for us to cover. Actually, that would be kind of cool. Cause I think that coming up soon, we're going to, obviously we're going to start covering Castle Rock season two, I promise. Um, and then we are going to be doing, I think on the docket, we're going to be doing, uh, at least in a few weeks, um, a review of revival. And, um, then eventually we're going to start our stand series of episodes, which is going to be pretty extensive. I'm excited about that, but all that's in the future. Let's talk about now. And when I say that, let's talk about the past. Um, (laughs) I recorded a special, uh, section of the podcast, um, with our Stephen King check-ins and Stephen King news. Um, I recorded that with tiny. So instead of doing my own, like one person, check-ins and news i'm gonna throw it to that pre-recorded section uh with me and tiny and yeah i'm gonna throw it there now so here is me and tiny talking about our stephen king check-ins and recent stephen king news this was recorded on i think it was tuesday yes it was tuesday last tuesday which was the 12th i think i don't know but may 12th um yeah so check that out Uh, here it is enjoy okay and joining me today for this news segment of this podcast that hopefully this is a clean edit for it. Um, it's tiny, tiny. How's it going? Good, man. What's up? Not much. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to get the, uh, audio, like the, the technology working tonight. (laughs) Um, I know, right? We've been podcasting for seven years. I know. And it took us an hour to figure out how to, (laughs) uh, hear each other talk. It boggles the mind. It it does. Um, so this is a special segment that I'm recording for an episode that I've been promising for years at this point, uh, my Duma Key review um, that I'm going to ride solo on, if that's okay with you. Go for it, champ. Good. Um, which is weird because I'm technically already going for it because this recording is now spliced into that episode and then... It's just that, and then we do this, and so news. Um, 
Uh, yeah. So, uh, first of all, do you have any Stephen King check-ins? Um, yeah, I, well, no, 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 uh, no I, well, uh, no. Okay. That was, that was a roller coaster. <laughs> that was terrible. Uh, it's, it was, it was fine. Um, cool. Well, I have some check-ins. Um, okay. I watched on kind of a whim. Um, oh my God. Sometimes they come back. Have you seen this movie or read the short story? Neither. Okay. I really like it. It was one of my favorite short stories in the Night Shift collection. Um, Mm. Basically, it's a teacher who uh, he has a traumatic past in which his brother dies. And now that he's an adult, he is teaching a class where the bullies who killed his his brother when they were kids suddenly start like becoming his students. it's a really interesting story and really kind of a uh, eerie story as well. Um, and the movie is pretty solid. <laughs> it was okay. better than I expected it to be. It's, I mean, it's like one of those early nineties, like um, kind of hokey and cheesy uh, adaptations. Um, there's a part where, <laughs> where um, the wife of the teacher is being attacked and she falls to the ground and she tries to reach for a knife that's right next to her. Um, and it is the most like awkward, like, Oh no, where's the knife? I can't get the knife. Thing. It <laughs> it's was, like an infomercial. It, 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 it exactly, it, exactly. <laughs> and it's hilarious. Um, nice. But yeah, but the makeup effects were really cool and it followed the short story pretty closely and I appreciated it for that. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I recommend it. It's on my Voodoo account, um, if you want to check it out there. Um, okay. Tiny, not the listeners. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then the other check-ins I have, um, I read Nosferatu by Joe Hill. Have Sweet. you read any Joe Hill? I feel like I read something. I think you read Horns. I think I did. I know I saw the movie. Right. But, uh, man, I, if I read it, I don't really remember it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, well, I've read 20th Century Ghosts and Heart Shaped Box, uh, Heart Shaped Box, and now, uh, Nosferatu. Nosferatu is pretty good. It's, it's, I'm, I might, I might do a solo episode where I'm just reviewing that. Um, okay. I think. So I'll keep it brief, but I will say that there are a ton of really cool Easter eggs. Um, hmm. both for Joe Hill stuff and for Stephen King stuff. Um, really, really cool. Really cool. Um, nice. yeah. So that's it for check-ins. Um, are you ready to talk okay. about a little bit of news? Yes, sir. Regarding Stephen King. Cool. <clears throat> First up, I want to give a shout out to a podcast that is about to launch, um, called the King cast, uh, two film critics, uh, Scott, Scott Wampler and, uh, Eric Vespi, they are launching a Stephen King podcast where they talk to celebrity guests and filmmaker guests about certain Stephen King novels, adaptations, what have you. Um, they've been teasing it a lot and I'm very excited about it. I know that they have an episode with Kumail Nanjiani talking about the running man and they have an episode uh, from what I've gleaned from their social media feeds. Uh, they have an episode where they talk to, um, Mike Flanagan for a long time. So, oh, nice. Yeah, very much looking forward to that. Uh, that's called the King Cast, and you can follow them on Twitter at, I think it's at KingCast19. Cool. Yes. And speaking of Mike Flanagan. Yeah. Can we talk about the big news that hit uh, the other day? Are you aware of this news? I am aware of this news. Okay, yes. Um, so. Uh, Mike Flanagan is writing and producing an adaptation of Stephen King's novel Revival. Um, and the reports said that he has the option to direct, which I hope he directs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you read Revival? I haven't, but it's in my audiobook queue. Nice. I listened to it uh, earlier this year in January. It was actually my first audiobook I listened to 
in 2020, not to brag. Um, I don't know why that would be a brag. <laughs> um, but it's very good. Um, it's, it's really, it's really good. It's, it's an interesting meld between like some of the things, some of the thematic elements of say pet cemetery and, um, I don't want to say the stand. Um, but it, it plays with the themes of like dark faith and dark religion and grief in, in some interesting ways. At times it kind of feels like a little bit of a not rehash of past themes from Stephen King's work, but it just feels like it's, um, it, it's kind of, kind of winking its eye at those things. Um, oh. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. I, in particular, the ending, um, I won't, obviously won't give anything away, but, um, like the big set piece at the end, the climax of the book, I would love to see Mike Flanagan create that on film. <laughs> like it would Sweet. be incredible. Um, yeah. So I'm excited about that. How do you feel about this news? And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, like I said in our review of, uh, Dr. Sleep, I'm super excited for anything Mike Flanagan's going to do. Um, and it's just a extra cherry on top that it's a Stephen King ad- adaptation. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm going to have to listen to Revival. I'm like flying through audiobooks lately. Nice. I yeah. need to capitalize on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, any Stephen King book you read, I will be game to read it with you and record a review of it. Okay, cool. Yes. So, yeah, I'm going to... Um, that's probably going to be one of the next ones I listen to is Revival. Nice. I will re-listen to it then. Sweet. Uh, yeah, let me know when you start it and I'll start it with you and we'll we'll uh, compare notes. Okay. Um, and it would be really cool because when the adaptation comes out, we'll have uh, an episode. Like we won't have to wait months to, <laughs> to like record the novel review. <laughs> right. Yeah. So like I've been – I've just been driving a shit ton for work. So nice. as as an example, I got a I got a new car, like my new I have a work vehicle that like I take home and everything. Nice. I got a new one um last Monday. So it was seven business days ago. Okay. And I have eleven hundred miles on it already. Holy shit. Yeah. So like That's I've driven almost nuts. like almost four hundred miles just the last two days. So Wow. And you've listened to book two of the stand and Dune yes. Messiah. Yes. What yes. else have you listened to? Uh, I'm a couple hours into um, Foundation by Isaac Asimov. Oh my god, that's awesome! <laughs> yeah, which I have never, never read or anything. So I w- oh wow, that is, man. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm gonna listen to that too, <laughs> and we're gonna talk about it um, okay. because I want to do like a segment for Patreon for anthology. Um, it's okay. interesting because I just listened to iRobot for the first time by Asimov. Nice. Um, and I tweeted this from my anthology account, but I said, if I, if I find myself falling down the rabbit hole of reading a certain science fiction author's work, you might say that I'm reading my Asimov. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So how do you like foundation so far? I'm so excited about this. It's pretty cool. Uh, I, I really didn't know. I didn't like, I don't really know anything about it. Like I, okay. Uh, I, I went in completely dark. You know, I just nice. knew that it's kind of a tentpole of science fiction mm. literature. Um, that's all I knew about it, nice. and so uh, it's pretty cool so far. I, I kind of like I'm I'm sort of in a vintage sci-fi kick right now with oh. Frank Herbert and and Asimov and stuff. And so uh, if I could I, hug I the s- computer, I would. I could hug the computer. <laughs> I same here. Same here. <laughs> nice. Um, but I uh, I think I prefer Asimov's writing. Just. To Frank Herbert's, Herbert's. Okay. Um, even though Dune is just an unbelievably good book. Um, nice. But yeah, so far, it's Man. it's cool. That's awesome. I really liked iRobot, and that was the first time I ever read anything Asimov. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. so we'll, we'll compare notes, but this will this will be good. Um, cool. So support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer, where I'm going to force Tiny to uh, talk to me about science fiction for anthology. <laughs> Um, okay. So yeah, back to Stephen King. Um, other news. The, oh, this is the reason why I wanted to do this news segment and everything and then spice it in. Um, we never talked about the Amazon prime dark tower adaptation. <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we talked about it when it was in the works in mm-hmm. January, Amazon passed on it. So it was dead. 
Um, yeah. Glenn Mazzara was shopping it around to other services and everything. And then today someone tweeted, uh, or a couple days ago, someone tweeted, um, saying that they read the scripts from the show and they think that it was amazing and that it would have been amazing. And then Glenn Mazzara had retweeted and said, thank you. And, and said, unfortunately it's dead. It's not, it's not going anywhere. Um, Damn. so it's officially like, he's not shopping it around anywhere. Like it's, it's officially not going to happen anywhere, Damn. Um, which is a bummer. It is a huge bummer. Yeah. Um, but also I want to get my hands on those scripts <laughs> for real, like really badly. I know. And the pilot that was shot. I, I want, I want <clears throat> that. Like if it didn't seem so, uh, uh, dorky i would tweet at glenn Ma- glenn mazara and like beg him for it but um but yeah i, I just yeah so how do you feel about this news and what do you think is next for the dark tower adaptation that could possibly happen in the future at some point i mean i remember when they were talking about the show i obviously i was super excited and like that's that's the medium that i want the dark tower to be adapted to i want it yeah. to be on television um like uh, obviously i was excited for the movie but that wasn't my first choice um and so i was super excited about it but i remember thinking like this is so soon after the movie yeah. flopped and the, the movie was horrible and it, like i think there's going to be a bad taste in people's mouths about it and like i just don't think it's gonna it's it's just too it's too tainted right now. It's yeah. it's stigmatized because of the movie, and so that's what I was worried about. And I, I have obviously, we may never know if that's what was one of the deciding factors in passing on the show is the fact that right. you know that that stagnation with the franchise. But um, that's how I felt about that. But obviously, I was enthusiastic about the the show coming out, um, and I liked the the fact that Glenn Mazzara was me too going to show run. I mean, he's obviously talented guy mm-hmm. um despite the fact that i've gotten away from the walking dead right um but, he but yeah it he's, when it was good <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. so but yeah uh so i it's it's a bummer but i somebody's got to do it someday somebody's got to make a good adaptation of yeah. the dark tower it's it's like it's got to happen with all these freaking streaming services and yes. there's so much content out there. Stephen King is so, so amenable mm-hmm. when it comes to adapting his work. Like it's gotta happen. Oh yeah. It's just, it's just gotta happen. And I, I have faith that it's, that someone's going to pull it off someday. I agree. I hope, I hope that that's the case. Um, yeah. and hopefully someday we will get a worthy adaptation. Uh, mm-hmm. Tiny and I are more than willing to fall into a showrunner position, uh, to, to <laughs> do a, uh, Weiss and Benny off it, um, from Game of Thrones, uh, for better or worse. <laughs> um, here's what I kind of always kind of come back to with the thought of a Dark Tower adaptation. Um, and I almost tweeted this, but I felt like you know, I, I didn't get around to it. Um, so... I've I've thought about this like what if there's not a film or TV adaptation but instead there is a Red Dead Redemption style open world massive video game single player video game that is the Dark Tower series wow where you're just roaming the the like wasteland and you get like it is just it is like that's that's the adaptation. That'd be really cool, actually. I, right? Like I, I would be so, like just the the visuals, like the visual aspect of it, like seeing that realized, like in a video game thing, and like like being a gunslinger would be amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe if like Rockstar Games can get it together, um, they can do it. That'd but. be so cool, and especially if. I'd be so cool. I'd be so enthusiastic about that if they actually, if like, if one of the visual things that they did was like, there was a, like, the tower was actually in the background all the time. Oh, yeah. And so, 
you know, you'd be like, oh, I'm going to go to the tower. And you'd walk towards it and it would just keep getting further away from you. And like, you could never actually get to it. Oh, that, and that's the game. That's just, that's, that's the, the game. game. Right. <laughs> and it, or it's like, you can't, you can't actually get to it until you, you know, you play the game and you go through the missions and absolutely. You, it would take like 70 hours of play to even get there or something like that. Like I would, that'd be, that'd be funny. Like, first of all, it'd be oh, funny. Yeah. And then secondly, <laughs> it would be like beautifully haunting if mm-hmm. they did that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That'd be cool. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe someday. I don't know. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. Any other news or anything? I don't think so. Um, no. Don't, yeah. No. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to go ahead okay. and talk about Doom Key by myself. So, uh, Sweet. yeah. So thank you for joining me for this quick segment, Tiny. And we're going to be back together next week ish. Uh, and we're going to start our Castle Rock season two review series. Um, yes, sir. So I'm super excited about that. We're doing three episodes. It's going to break down the first three episodes in one episode, the next three episodes in one episode, and then the last the last four episodes are going to be bro- oh, I'm confusing everything. Um, we're going to do three episodes of castle rock per podcast. And then after we do two podcasts, we're going to do two episodes of castle rock for the remaining four. Yep. Yes. Okay. It go to the archive page on tower Um, <laughs> and check that out. So, all right, well, thank you, tiny. And yeah, well, here is my review of Duma Key by Stephen Edwin King. <laughs> okay, so um, additional stuff that has come up since that recording. Um, really just one thing, I think. Um, so uh, there's going to be a new podcast coming out. Um, you can find it at thestandpodcast.com. It's going to start on May 29th. It is going to be a panel show uh, going. It, it's going to be set up as a, uh, a book club style um, reread of The Stand. Um, they're going to do 200 pages of The Stand at each episode, and it's going to be hosted by Jason Seacrest. Um, I'm not really familiar with him, but he uh, hosts and produces The Company of the Mad, and he's an author of horror fiction. Um, and he writes a column... Uh, called What I Learned from Stephen King. And uh, it's also pretty cool. He also has a Patreon, and apparently he uh, publishes a new short horror story or chapter from a serialized novel every month to subscribers of his Patreon page. Um, so, yeah, so that's cool. But his panel is going to include uh, the one and only Mike Flanagan, who uh, obviously we're huge fans of, uh, direct writer and director of Gerald's Game, Dr. Sleep, uh, The Haunting of Hill House, the upcoming Haunting of Bly Manor, and uh, Revival, uh, which is to be determined. And it's also going, the panel is also going to include on the podcast, it's going to include, I'm going to butcher her name and I apologize, uh, Tananarive Du. Uh, she's an award-winning winning novelist who teaches black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA. Uh, she was uh, an executive producer on Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror on Shudder. And uh, she's also apparently uh, played with Stephen King on stage in his rock band, The Rock Bottom Remainders. Um, and uh, of interest to, to me and um, anthology listeners, she is one of the writers of... She's she's uh, has a co-writer credit on an episode of the upcoming Twilight Zone Season 2. The episode's titled A Small Town, and it features Damon Wayans Jr., David Krumholtz, and Natalie Martinez, who actually also has ties to Stephen King, as Natalie Martinez was in um, Under the Dome. And it also has Paula Newsom. Um, So yeah, and that Twilight Zone Season 2 premieres on June 25th on CBS All Access. And then rounding out the panel on the Stand podcast is Anthony Bresnikin, who I've talked about in recent episodes as being just a really great um, journalist who writes a lot about Stephen King. Um, and he had that really great interview with Stephen King a couple weeks back um, where uh, they talk about quarantine and Trump and everything. He's just a really good writer, and I really respect his work. Um, and also, so, so yeah, so that's the stand podcast. I don't remember if it has like an actual ty- uh, like a name, but, uh, you can find more information at the Again, that launches on May 29th 
And also, it's worth mentioning, I uh, completely forgot to mention, that the King Cast, which I referenced in uh, that recording with Tiny, has launched, and I have since listened to their prologue episode. It's very good stuff. Very cool. Um, really, uh, really excited to see what they come up with. And they've teased their Dark Tower episode <laughs> uh, uh, very well. So I don't know what their dark tower episode is going to be about, but I think it's going to be a blast to listen to because they have teased it very well. Um, yeah. And then also on the kind of going back to the stand podcast, uh, check out the circle opens. It's a podcast that goes chapter by chapter through the stand. Um, I've listened to a little bit of it. It's very good. So check that out. And then, uh, down the road here in a few months, probably, uh, you'll hear our, uh, big long series on the stand. Um, so yeah. Yep. And then the other kind of piece of news that I got is that I got my hands on those scripts. Um, (laughs) the dark tower TV series, I have the scripts and I've read the first one. I only have two scripts. I read the first one, loved it. Hear more of my thoughts on it. If you subscribe to Patreon, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer, my Patreon exclusive recording for this episode was all about those, uh, that first script. But, uh, if you want a copy of it you know, shoot me an email or something, I'll email it to you. Um, but yeah, so that's Matt at obsessive com, by the way. Um, so yeah, so that's about it for news. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that section with tiny. And then now I'm going to go into my review of Duma key. Um, as always, I'm not going to be spoiling the book until I get into spoilers for the, epi- or for the, for the, uh, for the novel. Um, but here is a plot summary courtesy of Stephen King.com. After a construction accident in which he loses his right arm and his, di- and his divorce. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> Oh, I guess he does lose his divorce. Okay. I'm going to start over. <laughs> Jesus. After a construction accident in which he loses his right arm and his divorce, Edgar Fremantle moves from Minnesota to Florida to begin what his psychiatrist described as a geographic cure. He rediscovers his love of painting and finds that he is good at it, but his paintings seem to have something more to them. On Dumaki, he also finds a new friendship with Wireman, a kindred spirit seeking refuge there as a caretaker for Elizabeth Eastlake. Elizabeth's past also contains powerful memories that have been reawakened, uh... Reawaken, bringing all of them together to face an evil entity named Percy. Uh, Duma Key was published January 22nd, 2008, and there is actually a prequel story called Memory, which was, I guess, printed at the end of uh, Blaze, the novel Blaze, um, in which Edgar Fremantle recounts the horrific accident that cost him his marriage, half his body, and some of his mind. Um, I haven't read Memory, but uh, check that out. I guess it's printed in Blaze. Um, my history with the novel, um, before I get into my, obviously my review. So I kind of have a, I wouldn't say storied history with Duma Key, but I first tried reading it years and years ago, probably like six or seven years ago with Tiny. He and I were working together. Of course, you guys probably know we were security guards for many years. We worked nights and, uh, we both decided to read Duma Key and I got maybe a third of the way through it before I just kind of stopped. I lost interest or I, I don't know, working nights really made for bad reading energy. <laughs> um, like, cause I was struggling to stay awake at all times. And I was reading like Kindle, like on my Kindle and paperback and everything. And it's just like the attention span just wasn't there, especially when I was so sleep deprived. And I think that's maybe why I've gravitated so much to audiobooks over the last several years because, um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think I've, I think years of working third shift, um, kind of made it hard for me to actually concentrate on reading stuff. Um, I don't know what that says about me, but anyway. So I finally listened to the audiobook in its entirety back in June 2018 uh, when I went on vacation to Las Vegas, actually. So it was a couple of days. Okay, so I've talked about this on podcasts before, but I have I'm on medication for depression and um, I had just a really bad like panic and anxiety episode and depressive episode Um like it was a couple of days before I left for Vegas. So I was basically like a few days away from going on this trip. And I think I was, it was right when it was right when I, um, got a new job within the company that I work for. I think, I don't remember, but, um, <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. Um, and like, I was kind of in the in between there 
And I just, I had this just really severe panic. Like I, I had trouble breathing. I couldn't control, like it, it felt like everything was spiraling, spiraling out of control. And I literally like had no control over anything that was going on. So it was just unbelievably overwhelming. And like I said, I'm on medication for depression. And like, I didn't know, like, like, what is that? What is that? Like, what's going on? Am I like, I'm on medication. This shouldn't happen. And like the long and short of it is that like, okay, medication for mental disorders like that, like depression, like they are not a cure all. It is a, a bandaid. It's something to just kind of like you take it a day at a time. So, um, and sometimes, you know, Sometimes the depression wins, sometimes it doesn't, but I just, it was just so overwhelming and like it was, it knocked me out for like a day or two, um, where I was just like, I just didn't want to do anything. It was just like overcome with just, uh, just, just not completely unmotivated and just really, um, really just beaten and mentally. So that is to say that, um, like it it was, it was so bad that like I was sitting, I was sitting here and I was like having, like I was going through this like panic attack, like where I couldn't breathe. And I was like, I was trying to, like, I could not latch onto anything good. Um, it was very, it was terrifying to be, to be completely honest. And since then I've had a few more episodes like that. And it is, it is absolutely terrifying. Like it is, especially with like right now with fucking coronavirus and everything, but I'm good now. I'm fine and everything. Um, and it sucks because one of my coping mechanisms for my depression is to go see a movie and I can't do that. But anyway, um, I have the podcast, so that's fine. So anyway, all of that's to say is that I had this incredibly intense panic attack two or three days before I went to Vegas. And those two or three days before I left for Vegas, like I was... I mean, I was just a wreck. Like it was mentally just exhausted. I was mentally exhausted. And I kept thinking like, I don't even want to go. I don't even want to go on vacation. Like I just, I don't care. I don't want to bother with it or whatever. Nothing good will come of it and everything. By the way, I had a fantastic time. (laughs) Uh, I love going to Vegas and I had a really great time. So depression can talk for you, uh, or try to trick you into thinking negative thoughts when, uh, you don't really have a reason to be thinking negative thoughts. Anyway, this is getting away from me. This is why I need Tiny here to <laughs> rein me in. But all of this is to say that the reason that I listened to Duma Key in particular, um, I started listening to it like on the way to the airport and on the plane and on the plane back. And I finished it um, in like a week after that. Um, the reason that I picked Duma Key in particular is because Duma Key is a story about a man who experiences a traumatic event and is, is, uh, he go, he changes his location, uh, in order to heal. Like it is about a man healing from a debilitating situation. Like granted his, his incident was in- extraordinarily like physically painful and everything and extremely like an extreme example. Like he lost his arm and all that. Um, but I do remember, I did remember that in those, like that third of the book that I read, like he had mood swings. He had like, like mental, like illness uh, tied to it. Like his ment his mental state was completely fractured by it as well. So I started listening to uh, Duma Key because I felt like, okay, that'd be relevant because I just experienced this terrifying like thing that I went through and now I'm going on vacation. So it was kind of an interesting like therapeutic thing for me to listen to Duma Key. And that's one of the great things about, you know, being a fan of Stephen King is that he has this vast catalog of things that you can find these certain like personal rele- relevance to your own life and like read things for like therapeutic reasons, I guess. Um, so yeah, I don't know what I was getting with that, but, uh, it worked pretty well. Um, I was, uh, I had a good time and, uh, I kind of got away from the cloud of depression and anxiety and everything. And, uh, yeah, so that's why I read it in 2018. And then I planned on doing a solo episode reviewing it. And then I never did. Part of that is that I wasn't really sure how much, uh, how much personal detail I wanted to get into with that. And at this point, I'm like, I don't care. It's fine. It's part of my life and everything. So hope you guys enjoyed that piece, that insight into my life. But uh, yeah, and then over the course of the last year of 2019, at least, I re-listened to Duma Key just in passing while I was working at least two or three times in the build up to 
like actually recording an episode. And then I never did because I'm lazy and I can't uh, commit to that. So now I'm finally, finally doing this episode of Tower Junkies. And yeah, so that's my history with the novel. Um, also, I think... I think uh, one of my mom's coworkers, I think this was Doom McKee, or it might have been um, Under the Dome, but one of my mom's coworkers, uh, when Doom McKee was first released, um, one of my mom's coworkers, like his his mom, like worked at a warehouse or something, and she got like free copies of Doom McKee or something like that. And then my mom had told my her coworker that I was a fan of Stephen King, so he gifted me one of the copies, which I still own today, I think. No, I don't. No, I don't. Um, uh, yeah. So thank you to her coworker. Um, I finally listened to it in 2018. So thank you for that copy that I no longer have. Okay. So, all right, that's enough preamble. Let's go into my review of Doomakey. As usual, I'm going to be doing a non-spoiler section, and then I will go into a spoiler discussion for Doomakey. Um, when I do go into spoilers, I will play a piece of music so that you guys can, uh, can switch off or whatever. Okay, so non-spoiler review for Doom a Key. Um, I want to mention one quote from it. I don't know the page number or anything, but this is kind of a nice like thesis statement for the entire novel. Um, it's a quote from Wireman in the book. He says, quote, On Doom a Key, broken people seem to be special people. When they cease being broken, they cease being special. Me, I'm mended. You're still broken, so you're still special. So... Yeah, that's a nice like thesis statement for for the book, and I'll get more into the themes of it later in this review. But I just want to start out by saying that this book, I've listened to the audiobook, of course. Uh, it was read by John Slattery. He did a fantastic job. Um, I just, I don't know. He has a very he has a very pleasant voice, and uh, it really it really complemented the the novel well. Um, the novel's written in first person perspective from Edgar's point of view. Um, I felt like that was a good choice for this kind of story. Like St- King has written that way before in books that I've read of his. Um, one of the big ones is one that came out after this, but uh, eleven twenty two sixty three. But here in Dumaki, the first person perspective is really good for that to- story, especially since it's about Edgar's recovery and everything. And it was also. I don't know per se, I'm just speaking anecdotally, but I'm sure that writing it was very therapeutic for King um, after his accident. Obviously, this book was released in 2000, uh, 2008, and he had his accident in 1999. Um, so there is, I, I'm sure he was healed by then, but I'm sure that there's any type of traumatic event like that obviously leaves scars. So again, in non-spoilers, um, the book's biggest strength for me is the friendship between Edgar and Wireman. Um, the pair, they're really put together really well. In my notes, I have the pair are drawn, no pun intended, uh, really well. And the friendship and respect between them just feels really, really genuine. And I just was eating up every second that they were, that they spent together because they're just a really great, uh, it's a really great dynamic between the two. Uh, Wireman kind of has this, I don't want to say sage presence, but he's very much this laid back kind of, um, uh, laid back force of good for Edgar. Like he's very supportive and, and he's very, um, uh, supportive <laughs> of Edgar's recovery and everything. And it's just, it's very like they complement each other really well. And they kind of, as with any strong friendship, they grow as a result of their friendship together as people, as individuals. And I think that that's really painted really well, again, no pun intended, um, in, in the book. Um, and that's the biggest strength for, for the story. And it just, I don't know, the moments where they're confiding in each other and where the mutual respect that they share, like those moments um, just come through so clearly throughout the text. And I just, I really appreciated that part of the story. To kind of, in contrast to that, the um, relationship between Edgar and his daughter Ilsa was just kind of okay. Um, I'll talk more about it in spoilers, but I kind of felt like... I don't know, maybe it's because I'm I'm not a parent or anything, but I just felt like there wasn't a lot to it, to my liking. Um, I did really, uh, the care that Edgar has for, for her um, 
resonates pretty well, especially regarding like when he's nervous about her engagement and everything in her relationship without being able to kind of explain to her why, um, that is pretty okay. I'm like, that's pretty solid, but I think it's overshadowed, overshadowed by his, uh, friendship with Wireman in, in, the, in the book. Um, the kind of broad concept of the novel, like this concept of malevolent forces compelling him to draw or paint through his amputated arm, that at a conceptual level is really strong and really interesting. Um, it's he doesn't paint through the arm itself like it, through through the arm but it's like the sensation comes through like a supernatural version of phantom limb syndrome and the way that king writes it and the way that edgar recounts that or explains that through the through the book um is really just interesting and intriguing to me and just seeing king uh writing like king's descriptions of edgar's drawing and painting is just really um satisfying to me <laughs> um because so Stephen King obviously he writes a lot of writer characters a lot of his characters are writers and there is a lot a lot of passages in Stephen King's work that talks about just the act of writing and everything but in in this book in Dumaki seeing King describe a different art form and the con um not the con um in the process of completing that different art form is just really appealing to me and very satisfying to me. It's something that's you, you don't get out of a Stephen King novel because he doesn't normally write about drawing or painting or anything, but he kind of takes that passion for the process and transfers it over to um, a different medium. And it's just really uh, intoxicating to read uh, how Edgar is hungry to create art. And it's just like it, it feels so genuine and so real and it's so cool because King is a writer, not a painter. Um, it's kind of cool. And the book kind of furthers that ability that Edgar has by having him painting stuff that'll happen in the future. And I think that that's an interesting hook. So Edgar eventually starts painting the future, like the, uh, the concept of him being able to paint visions of the future is really interesting and everything. However, like a lot of Stephen King stuff, it kind of seems like he kind of lost interest with that section of the story. And he went on to, uh, painting things that will get, uh, will happen or, or that's kind of the same thing, but, uh, painting things that he wills to happen. So like when he paints, well, I'll save that for spoilers, but he paints things that will come true as a, as a force of good. It kind of seemed like King wasn't really sure which way he wanted to go, whether he wanted to paint visions of the future or paint um, uh, acts that Edgar does in the future, um, if that makes sense. Basically, it's a, it's a, it's a, sw it's a choice between painting visions of the future and, fa and painting what he wants to happen in the future. Um, yeah, and so there's a whole relationship uh, thing with uh, Elizabeth East, like not relationship per se, but it's she's the elderly woman who owns the island essentially, and she and Wireman is her caretaker, and she has a, a dark past on the island that plays into the book's kind of final climax and everything. Um, all that was okay. Um, I'll talk about that more in spoilers, but it kind of seems like it just was a little undercooked for me. Like it didn't really engage my interest as much as, as much as Edgar's supernatural abilities did. There are some parts where it worked very well. Like there's a part where, um, I'll say Edgar is visited by, has visitors in, in his, uh, home, Big Pink. And that was incredibly chilling. And like, it's one of the most, uh, visually stimulating, like senses of in imagery that just really, it kind of almost plays into a little bit of like the shining vibe, but just the execution of it in Doom and Key was really cool. And I would love to see that adapted to film in particular. Um, I'll talk more about that in spoilers and more about Elizabeth Eastlake, but I do want to mention before I go into spoilers and while I'm still in non-spoilers that I really like that the art community loves Edgar's work in the story. Um, as, as his work progresses, he paints a lot of things and the local art community just loves it. And Edgar is this 
like most Stephen King protagonists, he is this relatable down to earth guy, even though he is like a multimillionaire, um, uh, industrial guy or construction guy. Um, but he is very relatable and very likable specifically because he is an outsider to the art community. And like us as readers, for the most part, we are not part of that art community <laughs> as well. So we're seeing it from Edgar's perspective. And Edgar's perspective is that he doesn't understand this world that he just kind of stumbled into. And I just, I love that kind of, that setting and that uh, situation as means of getting us to empathize with Edgar. Um, and it's just, it's a very genuine thing. Like there's a part where he has to give a speech in front of a big group of people that are celebrating him and his work. And it's, it's really kind of a really great, um, <laughs> it's a really great, uh, example of stage fright on the page. Um, he's not sure how to give this presentation or give this, give this speech because frankly, he doesn't understand his ability and he doesn't understand what's good about what, like what he does. He's just painting to paint. And it's just this really interesting depiction of imposter syndrome, which is something that I, as a podcaster, uh, am very well um, acquainted with. And seeing it play out is just so rewarding and everything because we, when we see Edgar succeed and he becomes something of a local celebrity, it's just really satisfying because Stephen King has developed this character so well over the course of the novel that you got, you have to empathize with him even, even like in simple um, feats and successes as being accepted into an art community that he's never been a part of, Um, which is pretty high praise for King's writing in this, I think, because from the outset, we're supposed to empathize with him because of his injury. And even then we can't like King doesn't go the easy route in like in creating this character who's like super em empathetic or like who is super sympathetic, I should say, um, because he's not frankly, like he is a character who has suffered a trauma, but he is having these intense mood swings. And like he, it, when it says that when this description says that he, uh, uh, it cost him his marriage and he was, he divorced his wife because of it. It's not because it's too hard for her to take care of him and everything. It's because he was having mood, mood swings and like his mental state was so fractured that he like was a physical threat to her and could have potentially harmed her physically and maybe even killed her. And that's a hard route to get into for the, for the audience to sympathize with the character, with a central character in a novel, like uh, with a protagonist. And you could have easily made like King could have easily made him just be, Oh, he's just, he's injured and he's trying to get better. And below the surface, that's what he is as a character, but he doesn't pull any punches with how this trauma has affected his emotions and his mental state. And it's very authentic and it just feels very genuine. So when he gets to the point where he becomes more accepted in the art community and his, his, um, art is very respected and he becomes a kind of celebrity, it's, like a triumphant moment for him because we as a character have been so like privy to his intense mental, uh, degrade, mentally degraded frame of mind as, as he's, as he's healed and everything. So it's just very satisfying in that, uh, in that respect. Um, so yeah. And then kind of my closing thoughts on non-spoilers for this. Um, so the story, <sighs> I guess this is where I'll start to be kind of uh, critical of it. The story takes a really, really long time to kick into gear. Um, and by the time the story takes a turn toward what what will end up being the climax of the story, while also being more compelling Stephen King fare, um, at that point, I was already kind of over the book. This is about two-thirds of the way through the book maybe even more deep into the book, honestly, but it's such a sharp turn and I won't give away what it is in case you want to read the book and you haven't read it and you're listening to the non-spoiler, but it's such a sharp turn in the pace and the overall style that it just didn't really grip me. And that's one of the reasons why I had to listen to this damn thing a few times because I just, by that time, I just kind of, I, I won't say that I, um, I toned it out or anything, but it was just kind of, it kind of became a slog. It kind of became this, this thing, which is really, in, really, uh, surprising, I should say, because 
it's the most thrilling part of the book. Like this is the part where the story ramps up and where the everything kind of comes together and we finally get like this showdown and this this confrontation with the supernatural entity of the book and I was just so uninvested with it and I can't really say for certain why but it was just it was such a weird transition um like a lot of king novels it kind of turns into something else toward the end and I don't know if that's because of the way he writes his books or if it's something by design that he did when writing it but in this book, it just kind of didn't really do it for me, to be honest. But that's all I'll say for non-spoilers. I'm going to go ahead and go into a spoiler review for Duma Key so I can kind of talk talk out these feelings a little bit more clearly. Um, if you haven't read Duma Key, I do recommend checking it out. It's very it has very good characterization, especially if you have like if you've had had a hard time. It's a really interesting way to kind of get into the story, um, or an interesting way to uh, relate to the main character. Um, yeah, so I would say go ahead and check out Duma Key. It is good. Um, it's I don't know where it landed on my top nineteen or if it even made it into my top nineteen. To be honest, um, it's just it just it it uh, I I have such a hard time with this book. Um, it's it's oh yeah wow it's number twenty nine on my ranked list so it didn't make my top nineteen. Maybe eventually I'll reread it and uh, see if it lands a little higher. But for now, that's my non-spoiler review. Stay tuned for the spoiler review if you've read it. If not, enjoy this music and turn off the podcast and come back when you've listened to it or read the book. Uh, So we're going to go into spoilers after this moment here. Okay, so in spoilers for Duma Key. Uh, first off, the stuff with Percy and the whole reclaiming the figurine in Heron's Roost at the end of the book. Um, it's gripping and exciting, but it all comes up so suddenly that I had to kind of reorient my attention a little. And that's what I was talking about in the non-spoiler section. Basically, it just kind of switches um, a lot <laughs> in the story. Um, it just really dis felt like a little bit of a narrative whiplash uh, for me. And I think part of the reason why it didn't really work for me was that it's interspersed with um, the background or the the backstory of Elizabeth Eastlake and her family and her sisters and everything and her father. And I think that just juggling those two interconnected storylines just really felt like a lot it took a lot more mental energy from me <laughs> than I really kind of wanted to give to the book at that point. And it just felt again, like kind of a narrative whiplash. Um, it just changed up way too quickly and way too violently, I guess. Um, however, the imagery of that, like the description of, of like the trek into Heron's roost and um, the, the violence of it and everything. It's, it's very much a very descriptive and, and, uh, very intense imagery. And it's something that I think that if they ever made a movie out of it or a mini series, eh, it would probably work better, best as a movie. Um, I think that could look really cool on, on screen. And another thing that I kind of wasn't too keen on with it was that the kind of trio at the end, Edgar Wireman and Jack Cantori just kind of feels a little slapped together. Like Edgar and Wireman, they're great because they had, they've had like hundreds of pages beforehand to build up that friendship and everything. And then you kind of throw in Jack Cantori and he, I mean, he's just a college kid who's helped out Edgar. Um, that's it. Like he's not really that pivotal to the story until he becomes like a big part of the final section of the book. And it just felt again like it like the book didn't really do the heavy lifting to create a um an intriguing enough character in Jack Cantori to have him be a pivotal player in the end game of the of the uh story. It just seems like up until that point, it just seems like he was kind of just too much of a secondary character uh to have him be so integral to the final act of the story um so yeah, so that kind of just didn't really feel it didn't really mesh well with me. And again, since it inter- uh, intercuts between that storyline and the backstory with Elizabeth Eastlake, um, it just, it really was hard for me to, to re- really focus my attention on it and really dig into the kind of end game of the story. 
So to kind of, I don't know if this is necessarily a backtrack or not, but Edgar's relationship with his daughter, with Ilsa, um, again, like I said, it's a, it's a strength of the book. Um, not as strong as him and Wireman, and it's it's kind of a little, kind of doesn't really get fleshed out as good as I would have hoped it would have. But my biggest gripe with the book, with the book in general, um, not just with Edgar's relationship with Elsa, but the entire book is that her death comes up so quickly and so suddenly that it feels almost unceremonious in the grand scheme of things. Like the suspense isn't really there aside from King, you know, his signature foreshadowing where he sets it up. Uh, I think he says something like this is the last conversation Edgar is going to have with Elsa. Um, it just it just doesn't it doesn't hit home like when he, when Edgar gets the phone call and he finds out that oh yeah um the woman i think it was a reporter or art person i don't know uh just strangled her or something or just murdered Ilsa Ilsi Ilsi Ilsa um Ilsa um it just it didn't hit as hard as it should have it did not have really a good enough payoff for me and maybe it's because it's off the page like it's it's something that happens like that we just hear about afterwards it would even though it had been it would have been difficult obviously given the first person perspective and everything but if there was a way to kind of build toward that a little bit better um i would have been more taken with it but unfortunately like it's just so sudden like i i remember the first time i read through it or listened to the audiobook i remember i had to rewind it a few times so i was like wait she's she's dead okay that that's how they're going to do it in the book okay and this is how this is how king is going to deliver this this very shocking blow to the main character is with a phone call and that's it um it just felt just like it was too busy everything was too busy and it didn't have the proper weight attached to it that it that i think it should have and um but kind of on a on a lighter note or on a more pleasant note some of the early supernatural stuff is is good and well done edgar's vision of elizabeth's drowned sisters in big pink um in the middle of the night is really creepy like i said it kind of harkens back to this the the shining and the the twins in the shining a little bit um and the whole scene where they ask where our sister <laughs> um that is really chilling. Like I had very vivid like images of that in my head. Like I would love to see that on film, uh, especially with like the thunderstorms, the sound of the, uh, uh, the noises that the shells make and everything. Uh, it just, it, I, I could really see it. Like I could really see it in my mind's eye. Um, yeah. So then the final kind of showdown, it's fine. Like finding the, uh, figurine and, and, kind of burying it in the lake and everything like it's it's fine uh, by the end of it i was kind of uh, honestly a little bit ready for it to be over um <laughs> like it just kind of i don't know it, it was a little heartbreaking when when we find out that wireman dies of a heart attack a little bit later um but uh all in all it just it kind of just it was fine like it's a it's a perfectly middle of the road book for me and that's a shame because i, I went into it with such I wouldn't say high expectations, but I went into it with such a specific frame of mind that I wanted to love it more. Um, and unfortunately, I just it just didn't really connect with me as hard as it could have. Having said that, there are other parts that I did enjoy about it as well that I'm kind of blanking on right now because I know I missed several things. Um, the relationship and everything with Elizabeth Eastlake, I thought that that was interesting. The, um, the way that she kind of has these um, cryptic lucid moments where she says these things like the table is leaking and um some of the other stuff that she says throughout the book that's that's interesting and intriguing and everything um and john slattery he he did fine with her voice <laughs> it was it was fine in the audiobook um but i kind of wish that there was a little bit more with that like not i think that in the lead up to the kind of the final moments of the book where it intersperses between her backstory and, and the present day, I kind of wish before that we had more like moments of clarity with Elizabeth Eastlake. I kind of think that that would have been a lot more satisfying in the end game of the book. Um, yeah. I mean, King is such a prolific writer and he is a very verbose writer that it's kind of rare for me to think like, yeah, this could have used like another 200 pages and a little bit of kind of 
um, smoothing out of the of the uh, pacing of the story. Like if if he had committed to the supernatural stuff a little bit earlier um, and kind of carried that through to the end while also committing to the backstory of Elizabeth Eastlake and everything in the Eastlake family um, a little bit more in a more engaging way earlier in the book, I would have been more interested in the whole thing of Duma Key. But as it stands now, I was just kind of okay with it. Like there's nothing too terribly bad about it except for the, Death of Ilse, which I, I really wish was handled a, a bit better. But other than that, like, there's really nothing that um, nothing that necessarily stands out uh, in a big way in this book, and nothing that really damns it for me. Um, I said that it's probably I think it's number twenty nine in my list of Stephen King reads. I think it probably deserves to be a little bit higher than that, maybe twenty five or twenty six. Um, definitely not a, not a top nineteen, but I think that if it eventually gets a an adaptation, uh, I'll definitely revisit it before the adaptation comes out, and maybe I'll have bigger or better feelings about it then. But as it stands now, I just think it's just kind of okay. Before I go, I'm going to talk about some kind of Stephen King connections and everything. Um, so first of all, this was in talks to be adapted um, back in February of 2019. Um, it was reported that Dolores Claiborne director Taylor Hackford was in talks to uh, direct an upcoming adaptation of Duma Key um, with a script that was originally written by Tom Holland, the uh, horror icon. Um, unfortunately, that project is dead. Like everyone left the project. I think Legendary was in line to produce it, but they left the project and uh, the creative people involved left it as well. So um, it's in development hell. Probably not going to, that iteration of it is no, not going to see the light of day. But, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll get adapted someday. Um, like I said, I think it could be transferred very well into film um, and be very engaging on a visual level, um, especially the setting. I mean, kind of off the coast of Florida, like it's a really good setting. And I think that that could be very, uh, cool, um, to see, uh, Stephen King stuff happening off the coast of Florida. Um, as far as dark tower and Stephen King connections, um, my really, really the only connection I have is that Edgar Fremantle's kind of abilities on the Island, his, uh, the supernatural abilities, uh, kind of remind me a lot of Patrick Danville, which, is a character in Insomnia, but I haven't read Insomnia. I think it's in, he's in Insomnia. Yeah. Um, but he does factor in uh, in the final Dark Tower book, Dark Tower 7. Um, and he has some uh, interesting abilities, I'll say that. But it's similar to Edgar Fremantle, so it's something that King has uh, played with a little bit in his writing um, previous to Duma Key. And I do want to mention, if you listen to the podcast, obviously... Um, I believe that Dumaki is referenced in Castle Rock season one, the finale. Um, we see a character that may be in um, their the show's version of Big Pink. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that about does it for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed this long-awaited review of Dumaki. It's kind of brief, but I mean, I read it a while ago, and I don't think I would have had more to say about it had I read it more recently. So um, let me know what you thought of Dumaki. And uh, I think next time on the podcast, we are going to do, uh, we're going to start our review series on Castle Rock Season 2. Um, we're going to do three episodes for the first episode. <laughs> you heard earlier, I messed up with this. So the next episode of the podcast will be Castle Rock Season 2, covering episodes 1 through 3. And then after that, we will have an episode that covers episodes 4 through 6. And then after that, we will have an episode that covers episodes 7 and 8 of Castle Rock Season 2. And then finally, we will have an episode that covers episodes 9 and 10 of Castle Rock Season 2. There. That's the best way to say, <laughs> to say it. <laughs> um, okay. So, and I think we might have some other stuff interspersed in between that. Maybe not. We'll see. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. Again, we will have more coming out soon and, uh, check out uh, towerjunkies.com, towerjunkiespod.com slash masterlist for a list of all the Stephen King stuff that we, uh, have 
at our fingertips to talk about and uh, podcast about. And yeah, again, check out and also check out uh, Patreon if you are in a giving mood. Support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Uh, minimum rate of $1 per month. You get access to an exclusive RSS feed that has content not only from Tower Junkies, but from Obsessive Viewer and Anthology um, recorded specifically for Patreon supporters. You get all of it and an entire backlog. We have like 60 episodes on Patreon for $1 per month. I mean, that's not bad. So check that out, patreon.com slash obsessive, or, yeah, <laughs> shit. <laughs> patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. And, uh, yeah, that'll do it for this episode of Tower Junkies. Uh, long days and pleasant nights, and may you have twice the number. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. And he said that he did. And he emailed them to me. And I have the scripts. And oh, oh, man. Okay, first of all, yes, it is heartbreaking. It is absolutely heartbreaking that this will not see the light of day. Because I'm here to tell you guys, Glenn Mazzara gets it. Like, he... He fucking gets it. Like the like okay, there are two scripts. One is for the first episode, it's called The Gunslinger. Tower Junkies is edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by obsessiveviewer.com. For a full archive of our episodes, go to towerjunkiespod.com slash archive. You can also like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash towerjunkiespod and follow us on Twitter at Tower Junkies Pod. If you enjoy the show, please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. This is the easiest way to support what we do, and all it costs is just a little bit of your time. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can make a PayPal donation at towerjunkiespod.com slash donate, or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. For official Obsessive Viewer merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more, visit our Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at obsessiveviewer.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at tpublic.com. For information about our annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. For more podcast content, you can find our flagship movie and TV review and discussion show, The Obsessive Viewer Podcast, at obsessiveviewer.com and on Twitter at obsessiveviewer. You can also find Anthology, Matt's solo podcast covering The Twilight Zone, and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology TV shows at anthologypod.com and OV Anthology Pod on Twitter. And finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at thesecularperspective.com. Music for the podcast is provided with permission from Fingers T on YouTube. Additional bumper music is provided courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at facebook.com slash asgoodasitgetsband. Thank you so much for listening. Long days and pleasant nights. Kitty!